For Polity in Johannesburg, I'm Darlene Creamer. Authors Ian Fur and Nina de Klerk are with me to discuss their book, The Human Bridge, Racial Healing in South Africa. Ian, in your book, we read about your entrepreneurial journey from setting up a record company to starting a national chain of beauty salons and more besides. Please tell us a bit about growing up in apartheid South Africa. What motivated your various commercial ventures, the role race played throughout, and what you mean by the human bridge? In terms of my entrepreneurial journey, it started at age 22. I dropped out of university and my older brother came back from America one day and said, we need to open up a business called Paymart, which he had seen there, a big departmental discount store chain. And he said, we should open this in South Africa. And and I said, which one of us is we? And, and he said, well, you. And, and I, I didn't know much about retailing at all. Nothing, in fact. Um, I, I'd never been in retail. I hadn't qualified at, at university. So I was very naive and and a bit clueless when it comes to that type of thing. Anyway, I said, sure, let's do this. Sounds like fun. Uh, so we started to plan the opening of Kmart in South Africa. I didn't know much about trademarks, so just used their name. And also didn't know much about logos, so used their logo as well. So that wasn't very good. It would come back to haunt us about 12 years later. But nevertheless, we opened this business. It was supposed to be aimed at the black market. I knew even less about the black market than anything else. And so it was a real baptism of fire. We opened up the business. We advertised some incredibly low prices. And literally thousands of people came from all over the country to come to this opening. It was right in 1976, not long after the uprisings in Soweto, and the police thought it was another uprising in the middle of town because they hadn't seen that many people in town for a long time. And, and so we eventually settled down. I was the only white person in, in the business, so I had to ask some people to help me. One guy in particular, his name was Ralph. Ralph tried to help me how to communicate with, with people that were different to me. Uh, it was a bit of a struggle, but I got working on it. But then something happened that really sort of changed my life. There was a consumer boycott going on at the time where black people were boycotting white-owned stores. And one day, one of our staff comes running into me and says that Ralph has just been seen handing out pamphlets in the streets of Johannesburg, promoting a boycott of our own store, which was really, in my view, was a terrible betrayal. And I was very upset and called him in and screamed and shouted and was ready to fire him when he said, uh, if you can just uh, hear me out, I have something I want to share with you. I said, fine. And he said, you know, I thank you for the job and everything else, but when I come into work in the mornings and when I come home in the evenings, just about every day I'm harassed by the police for some or other ridiculous apartheid law. And he said, we are really suffering here. You don't understand how the people of this country are suffering. And then he said something that was quite profound. He said, for me, it's always going to be freedom first and work second. And I thought, well, okay, that was a big eye-opener. And I realized that you couldn't ignore the impact of the socio-political environment on people's lives and on the workplace and things like that. So I asked him to mentor me. And he said, sure, as long as you're willing to come to Soweto and see for yourself what's really going on and that's that's when it all started so I saw Soweto for the first time I hardly even knew that it existed up until then and it was just a massive awakening and I saw there was another country in our country that I just knew nothing about nothing so that was the beginning of my journey towards racial healing and also social justice which I'm still busy with now and I suppose one of the reasons that we wrote this book, it's still ongoing. It hasn't changed. It's still happening. And so that, that was the one thing. Then I got involved in other businesses. I was in the music business. I started a race relations consultancy. And then after that, I went back to, to Kmart, which is now Supermart. I sold that to Edcon, and they rebranded it, called it Jetmart. And then eventually I opened Solbay, and that was an opportunity to try and work on the 
culture framework that I had developed over the years, and I called it culture nearing. And throughout all of this, there was the tremendous fascination with race relations. And I just could see the impact of race and racism on the workplace, on productivity, on service. So I developed a framework where we could address these issues and realize that if we didn't address them, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to move forward. And so that's, that's how the whole thing unfolded. The other question was the human bridge. What brought that about? So I do consulting now. I run a company called the Hatch Institute, and we do race relations work in these organizations, large and small. And it became quite obvious that race was slipping off the radar a little bit in the workplace. Uh, people weren't talking about it anymore. I was trying to work out whether or not that was just because they were tired of it or if they were too afraid to deal with it or what the issues were. But it was definitely not being confronted. The courageous conversations were not being had. And I decided, okay, I need to do something about this and decided then we need to write the book on racial healing. I then reached out to the professor here and uh, asked her to help me with some research. And she co-wrote the book with me and uh, I was very, very happy to have her on board. And the name, The Human Bridge, just came at, at some point in time during the writing of the book. I was trying to think of, of a name, and that eventually popped up and decided that The Human Bridge would, would work as a name for racial healing in South Africa. And Nina, why is racial healing still so crucial 30-plus years into democracy? And could you also elaborate on the book's title, The Human Bridge? As Ian has just explained, South Africa may have overcome the dark days of oppression and apartheid, and we may have negotiated a new democratic dispensation, a constitution which is a wonderful constitution, and lately we've established even another government of national unity. So we are by no means belittling what South Africa has achieved over the last 30 years. But we are of the opinion that many of these systems that have been put in place have also remained largely stuck because the relationships between the people that make up these systems haven't healed. We see that in our schools, we see that in our campuses, we see that in the workplace, and we also see it with the infighting in the GNU. Alas, we also see it in a kind of white silence, a silence of withdrawal where the walls may have come down, but many South Africans still prefer to stay at home in gated communities, and they are trapped by their own fears and resentment of change. So we are in bubbles. We are not truly relating. And I think this was very well put by L.B. Sachs, Justice of the Constitutional Court, which is quoted by Lucanio Collata, who said, today, South Africa is the country we sacrificed for, but not yet the society. So I'm in communications and I'm a researcher and I take interest in how complex systems are made up. And of course, in South Africa, diversity is uniquely complex. So I believe the sustainability of any system, including the GNU, is determined by the nature of the relationships between the people that make up the system. But I think you will appreciate that relationships in turn are determined by the nature of the communication between people. It's not the system that makes the communication, it's the communication that makes the system, which does not mean that it's not important to change systems. I mean, as we've mentioned in the book, if round about 65% of the youth remains unemployed and the top 10% of the country holds 75% of the wealth, and if 75 murders are committed every day 
We need to take a hard look at those systems. But all we are saying is that we should not look at the systems only and then neglect the healing of relationships between the people. With respect to the naming of the human bridge, I think it emanated when we wrote chapter 10. Originally, we wanted to write Ubuntu. And while we regard Ubuntu as important, we also concluded that it's insufficient on its own to create a new South African culture. Instead, we propose the construction of a human bridge to marry the multiple truths or the apparent paradoxes that exist, such as an African collective consciousness and a Western individual consciousness, accountability and collaboration, the past and the future, and so on. Yeah, and you argue that while South Africa has moved beyond apartheid, it has not moved beyond racial polarization. Explain why you believe that virtually every problem South Africa faces is influenced by a legacy of systemic racism and elaborate on the difference between non-racism and anti-racism. I think we need to look back into the history to understand the issues around race and racism. And right all the way back to the colonial days when people arrived from Europe with a very superior attitude and a dominant type of racial attitude. And they created what is called the hierarchy of human value, which places people or groups of people into a hierarchy based on their race, and some are more superior than others. And that has filtered through our history right along up to apartheid and beyond that. And so it still sits with us. And, and the real challenge for many South Africans is they don't know the full extent of our history and how brutal it was, how inhumane it was, how unjust and how unfair it was. And people are now wanting to put it behind us. But unfortunately, that's not possible. You're not going to be able to move forward in this country until we have recognized the damage that has been created, the psychological damage, not only the economic damage, which is much more visible. The psychological damage is invisible and, and we can't easily detect it. It's there, though. When I work in companies, we speak to a lot of people and we hear about how they were made to feel inferior at home, you know, and in the townships and, and also at the workplace and how they suffer from the imposter syndrome, which means that they don't believe they deserve to be where they are. So there are so many angles of humanity and society which have been impacted by years and years of systemic racism. And so we feel that it, it must be addressed. Just about everything in life in South Africa is touched by race in one way or another. As much as we don't like to acknowledge it, it's there. Just about everything that you can think of has got some racial implications in terms of our lifestyle, our society, the country as a whole, and all the challenges that we face. So yes, it, it, it's really important that we deal with race. A lot of people will come to me and say, can't we just put it behind us? Young people, young white people in particular say, don't blame me for the sins of my fathers. Look, now I can't get a job and look how unfair it is without really acknowledging how unfair it was for the last 300 years for the for the other people in the country. And, and so, yes, these young men and women were not perpetrators, but they were certainly beneficiaries of the system. And therefore there needs to be some sort of compromise and understanding that unless we can deal with the issues that have divided us over the years, we're not going to be able to make any meaningful progress going forward in this country. When it comes to non-racism and anti-racism, it's quite a controversial subject in, in the States in particular, not used here a lot, but we feel it should be used here because there is a difference. Non-racialism is, is a more passive approach People say, I'm not a racist, I don't see color, I'm color blind, um, all of these things. And it's very passive. They, they understand what racism is more or less, 
but they don't want to talk about it. They they want to hope that it disappears by itself somehow, some magical way. Whereas anti-racism is a much more proactive way of looking at racism and calling it out when you see it and being much more aware of it and conscious and not being afraid to talk about it and to have the difficult conversations. So those are the main differences there. Non-racism says, yes, there is a problem, but I don't really want to deal with it. Uh, I prefer to ignore it and hope that it goes away. Whereas anti-racism says, I'm going to do something about it, you know, and, and not let it slip by every time I see it or hear it or experience it. Nina, South Africa's constitution emphasizes non-discrimination and equality. Yet, we are still one of the most unequal societies. Why does this dark stain on our country persist? Darlene, I think I may have already partially addressed uh, this issue via my previous answer, where I said we have focused too much on systems change without paying sufficient attention to relations. But in addition to that, I believe that to a large degree, South Africans have failed the Constitution. It has become a set of ringing phrases. Many of us do not recognize the injustices of the past, are not working to heal the divisions, or simply choose not to talk about it. It becomes a kind of a cop-out. So we believe that we can take an important guideline from the judgment of Chief Justice Nkobo of the Constitutional Court, who said that decades of systemic racial discrimination entrenched by the apartheid legal order cannot be eliminated without positive action being taken. So what we believe is important and needed is po positive action, a kind of activism, as it were, that recognizes that the constitutional claim that everyone is equal before the law is the expression of an ideal. It is not yet the reality. Everyone is not equal before the law because of the way in which race and racism impacts differently on the lived reality of different people. And as Ian just said, a colorblind approach to race inevitably leads to turning a blind eye to racism and its consequences. So we are of the view that while race is a social construct, perceptions of race are still very, very real. And it is, by the way, the dark stain for many other countries too, where racial and ethnic conflict persist. So it is the perception of race which is the scourge and the reason for this book. So what is needed is to unlearn our racial perceptions and stereotypes. Yeah, and you speak about your privileged life growing up and that you came to realize that privilege was largely about absence. Please can you explain what you mean by this? Right, so and you know, most people think that privilege is all the things that you have. You have wealth, you have riches, you you have nice big homes, you have cars, you have all of those things. But on my travels into the townships and working with black people all my life, I realized that it wasn't really what I had. It, it's what I didn't have that was the major impact on me. I didn't have racism. I didn't have police brutality. I didn't have to travel on three taxis to get to work. I didn't have to squash into trains. I, I didn't have to beg on the streets. I didn't have to do any of those things. That's all the things I didn't have to experience which really changed things for me. In fact, there was one incident in my earlier years when I was a young boy that, that taught me a lot about all of this stuff, although I didn't realize it at the time. I had gone to rugby one day with, with my older brothers. Uh, they took me to a rugby test, South Africa, New Zealand at Ellis Park. Uh, it was 1960. I was seven years old. And uh, we were standing in the queue because we had to buy tickets. You had to wait in the queue. So we went before dawn and we stood in the queue. And then as the sun was coming up, 
group of, of black men came walking down the street on their way to work. Of course, the queue was, was all white. There were no black people in the queue at all. And then all of a sudden, a couple of men in the queue started taking out notches from a bag and, and pelting these people with notches. Uh, and swearing at them, I didn't know what they were saying because it was an Afrikaans. I didn't understand what it was. They were shouting and swearing and laughing, and these guys were scattering all over the place. And I just couldn't believe what was happening. And afterwards, I asked my brother, "What what happened here? What's going on?" And and my oldest brother just said to me, "Welcome to apartheid." Ian. You know, you will find out as you grow up about all of this stuff. And that, that was something, although I didn't understand it at the time, I didn't realize it. I think it planted a seed in my mind, and I've never forgotten that day. I remember it like it was yesterday. And it's been my mission ever since to try and find some sort of justice so that things like that never, ever happen again. Nina, please speak to us about moving from the world of all and entering the world of and. That's my pet subject. Um, I think it's fair to say that this book was definitely not only about black and white or black and white polarization. That would simplify matters grossly. It's about black and white and many shades in between. So what we say is what is needed to build the human bridge is to leave the world of all and embrace the world of and. Because in the world of all, things are rules-driven. It's yes or no, black or white, right or wrong, good or bad, us or them, victim or perpetrators. And so we can go on. Once we enter the world of and and acknowledge that in every one of us, there is good and bad, right and wrong, the yin and yang, as it were, we can construct the human bridge. And it's as Chris Brunk, we quoted in the book, said, you cannot play a leading role in any complex situation if your choices are limited to one of two, if it's either or. So it's only when we can acknowledge complexity, when we can welcome disruption and diversity, that we can begin forging a new social compact. Having said that, and perhaps because of that, we also make it clear that healing is not easy. It's not a quick fix. It's hard work. It's a lifelong work. It's ongoing. It's like two steps forward and one backwards. It's hard to harness one's own demons. It's even harder to discuss it with others. But the key to racial healing is to acknowledge it. We don't have to be perfect, but we need to deal with it and share it with others. And more importantly, to talk to others, not through others or at others. Only if we understand ourselves, we can start understanding other people's hang-ups, histories, fears, traumas, blind spots. So for healing to begin, hurt needs to be spoken and heard. But talking is not where it stops. There comes a point where you stop talking and just do it, as Rassi did, and you start walking the talk. Lastly, your book includes essays from 11 contributors who share their perspectives on racial healing. Please can you both provide one or two things that you personally took away from these contributions and elaborate on your vision for the human bridge beyond this book? I think I'll name two of, of the contributors. One was Lucanio Calate, who told an unbelievably moving story about how his father was murdered by the security police in 1985 alongside three others. They became famous for being the Craddock Four and, and still are spoken about today. And, and the, the article is how he sought justice and how he went on a personal healing journey, which is really profound. The other one was Ruth Mayer's article about the negotiations and the paradigm shift that needed to be made from 
the old order into the new order and the impact of that and behind the scenes activities with FW de Klerk and Cyril Ramaphosa, really eye-opening and highly educational, those two articles. In terms of what's going to happen now after the book, we have just launched the Racial Healing Movement on Friday. In fact, we held a, a webinar and launched the Racial Healing Movement, which is a movement that is being created to put in place a whole lot of different activities that are there to promote and implement things that will lead to racial healing in South Africa. And there's a whole lot of different activities. People can join us and we welcome people to come in and collaborate, whether you are a trainer, a facilitator, a manager, whatever it is, there's work to be done in this country. And we have already started from Friday getting a whole lot of applications for membership of the movement, which is very exciting. Adding to what Ian said, two things stuck with me uh, from the country, actually three. Number one, if you look at the essays by Jonathan Janssen, Bonang Mohale, Lucanio, Loretta Ferris, it all points to the damage that the legacy of apartheid has left in its wake. And as Jonathan Janssen said, the things that still sit with us but what also stuck out is the way in which people like Lucanio could overcome the grief, the trauma, and the anger, which is so inspiring in terms of moving forward and building a human bridge. I think the other thing that stuck with me is the importance of talking to others, not through others, which was actually something that Leon Vessel said. And the importance of familiarizing oneself in racial healing with each other's cultural histories. And that was emphasized over and over by the essays by Mabali Baduza, by Max de Prier, by Sylvester Choki, by Karen Dean, by Janssen, by Rolf Meyer, and Padma Moodley. But I think one key theme that we also took from the collaborators in line with what I've said before about the complexity and the world of and is that this is not a book about black and white only, but black and white and many shades in between. And I think we cannot underestimate what Loretta Ferris and Padma Moodley wrote about, and that is the erasure of coloredness and the disavowal of colored people and their lineage. In a country where one is regarded as not white enough nor black enough, there are serious problems, which is why we also refer to the exclusion of people of color via what could easily be perceived as the old concept of groupthink. I think what we're trying to say is we need to move away from group or tribal or herd thinking, whatever you call it, and to concentrate on that which unites us, not that which divides us. So in terms of overall vision, I would simply repeat again the importance of acknowledging the existence of multiple truths, of devoting our attention to the greater good, not the parts, and to develop a new narrative or discourse and forge a new social compact. What we need is a conviction, commitment, action, a movement. I think the greatest gift we can give to our children is the gift of our own healing. And this movement, this bridge, should be the legacy to the youth in which we paid great attention to in the book. Because children are not born racist. It's the older generation that pass on their anger, their traumas, their fears, and their blind spots. So I think it's an important take out also for our vision that we should start young, that racial healing and the building of the human bridge should be very much focused 
on the young generation. That was Ian Fu and Nina de Klerk discussing their book, The Human Bridge, Racial Healing in South Africa.